If you have a Bible with you, you might want to turn to the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. What we've been doing this summer is working through some Old Testament stories, and they are all fascinating to me. The most difficult part, at least for me, has been choosing which stories to talk about because there's so many interesting stories there. Now, the story I've chosen for today probably can't all be talked about in one Sunday, so it probably will take today and next Sunday as well because it's quite an interesting story, but somewhat involved as well. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, this is what it says. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Menuhites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Now, we've got to stop there and tell the back story. It'll take me a few minutes to tell the backstory, but if we don't understand the backstory, then this doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm going to go back a few hundred years before this. You see, when God had brought his nation Israel together, had put them in the promised land, to begin with, he governed them through a series of judges. And so people would come to the judges all in the cities. The cities all had judges and ultimately one judge at the top. You may remember from your Bibles the names of some of the more famous judges, such as Samuel and Deborah. She was a very famous judge who ruled Israel. The Israelis, though, felt that they needed a king. They wanted a king because the other nations had kings, and they wanted to be like other people. And so God told them, you don't really need a king, but they insisted, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, until finally God said, you want one? You got one. And so God anointed a man named Saul. He was taller than his average people around him. By the way, the anthropologists indicate that the average Jewish male at that time was about 5'3". And so if he's a head and shoulders taller, which is what the Bible says, then let's say he's about 6'3". So he's a big man in their culture. And he becomes the king. By the way, he will be the only uncontested king in the history of the United Israel. The only one. Well, he reigns for many years. And basically, while he's reigning, he goes crazy. I mean, he's loony toony to be the technical term. And as he gets toward the end, he finally goes into battle and he is killed. One of his relatives anoints himself as king, although God had already indicated that a young man by the name of David would be the next king, and so now Israel has two kings. It takes a period of years to resolve all this, by the way, and there's a story of treachery, a story of battles, a story of political alliances, until finally David is able to unite Israel all together unto him, and he becomes the uncontested king for many, many years. David finally is an old man. As he's on his deathbed, David had fathered many sons. David had several wives. And so these boys were sometimes full brothers, sometimes half brothers. And as he's on his deathbed, one of those deathbed, one of those boys decides he should be the king. He rallies his brothers around him, all but one. And those brothers decide, okay, we'll support you. You'll become king. The one brother he didn't call to his side had a mother by the name of Bathsheba. You may remember the story in the Old Testament about David and Bathsheba, how their relationship started in a very bad way through adultery. And then David had her husband murdered. And then finally, David had married her and then had a son, and that son's name was Solomon. So while Solomon's brother, half-brother, actually had declared himself king, although David was still alive, he was dying. Bathsheba came to David and said, you need to understand something. The only threat he has is my son, Solomon. And as soon as you're dead, he's going to kill Solomon and he's going to kill me. Now, if you love me, then you need to put Solomon in as king now. And so David did. David made Solomon king. So as you see, as I said earlier, King Saul was the only uncontested king of all of Israel. Solomon lived large. He spent a lot of money. He built this immaculate, amazing temple and it cost a fortune to build it. It was such craftsmanship that when they cut the stones hundreds and hundreds of miles away, they were cut with such precision that when they got to Jerusalem and put them together, they slid together perfectly. Now that temple cost a fortune to build. Plus, he had a pretty large entourage that was being supported by, by the country there. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines, just the credit card bill was staggering. And so he had all this that he had to do and, and that takes money. You say, well, where does the government get its money? Well, it can print money, I guess, or stamp money as they would back then. But after a while, if you don't have some underlying value to base that on, then you destroy the economy and everything falls apart. So you really have to get that value somewhere. Well, where do you get it? Well, you can invade another country and take their resources. 
Well, that's kind of a downside in some fashions. I mean, there can be an upside, but a downside as well, because you see, if, if you do that, you may lose. Plus, wars are expensive. Plus, even if you win, even if you win, if you spread your armies out too thin, somebody may look at you and decide that they'll take your resources. Plus, Solomon's not a fighter. I guess Solomon would describe himself as a lover. And so the next thing, if you're not going to invade another country and take their resources, is that you might borrow money from another country. I guess Solomon didn't realize you could borrow money from China. Or, or maybe because God had given him great wisdom, he realized if you borrow enough money from another country, after a while they may own you. So he didn't go that route. And so there's another way to get money, and that is that you take it from the population. Typically that's called taxation. And so he raised the taxes to pay for this beautiful temple and the elaborate lifestyle that he lived. And since the people loved Solomon, although they grumbled, they tolerated it. Finally, Solomon dies. His son takes over. We're getting close to the end of the story, the backstory. When his son takes over, his advisors come to him and said, now look, your daddy was tough because he raised the taxes and raised the taxes and raised the taxes and the people were not real happy with that. And so if you really want to win the heart of the people, you need to decrease the taxes. He said, if they think my father was tough on them, wait till I do what I'm going to do. It'll feel like that he just had his little finger on them and I had my whole hand on them. And so he raised the taxes. People will only take that for so long. The population of the nation, as the taxes increase and more and more burdens put on them and they have to pay for government excess, finally will rebel. If England had stood that, if England had understood that, we might still have the queen on our money. He didn't understand it. He raised the taxes and set up everything for a coup. And so another man rose up and said, we've got to overthrow this king. We can't let these taxes go higher. And so now they split. From now on, there'll never be one nation called Israel. An entire Old Testament from this point on, it will not exist. There's going to be a northern kingdom. That's where that, that coup went, the, the guy who was the insurrectionist. And 10 of the 12 tribes are up here, and they become known as Israel. Two of the tribes stay faithful to Solomon's son. They become known as the country of Judah, and they are down here, and they have Jerusalem. So here's Jerusalem and Judah with the two tribes. Up here is Israel with the ten tribes. By the way, this king realized, I may be in trouble, because when they start going back to Jerusalem to worship, they may start missing their kin folks and their religion. And so he set up two different places up here, Dan and Bethel, for the people to worship so they wouldn't go back. Now, this northern kingdom is going to have 19 kings through its history. Finally, the Assyrians are going to come in and destroy it. As a matter of fact, those 10 tribes after that will be called or referred to in history, not in the Bible, but in history as the 10 lost tribes of Israel. This country, Judah, is going to have 20 kings before finally they're destroyed, and they'll be destroyed by the Babylonians, who will take... The, the elite, the rich people, the educated, the leaders, the rulers, and they're going to take all of them captive and haul them back off to Babylon, which is in modern-day Iraq. Now, now we got the backstory. We're back to verse 1. This king, Jehoshaphat, is number four in Judah. He's the fourth king in Judah. He's a good guy. His father's name was Asa. Asa tried to follow the way of the Lord. So did Jehoshaphat. As a matter of fact, it says he was devoted to the way of the Lord. And, and he took the Levites and other people, and he sent them from town to town to town to teach the law. Now, he didn't do everything right. There were still some things he didn't do right at all. But he, he did everything he could to get people to come back to God, and God blessed him. God blessed him in various ways. And this becomes part of the story. He has an army, but understand, his army consists of the soldiers from two tribes. Up north... They have an army that consists of 10 tribes. They're a lot larger. Now, here he is, and from over <laughs> the, uh, to his left, or actually to, uh, from the side, come these three armies that have united against him. The Moabites, the Ammonites, with the Minuites, and they're coming to defeat him. Verse 2. 
So men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. What he was saying is, what they said was, there's a lot of them, and they're headed here, and we're in trouble. Verse 3, that Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now, he had soldiers, and they were good, but he was afraid because he knew he was outnumbered. He knew that he didn't have enough army to fight these people. He knew that in a pitched battle, they probably were going to lose. Now, you start looking at his options and think, now, what's he going to do? Well, let's see. If you're outnumbered, if the enemy's coming against you and you don't have enough resources to fight back, you don't have enough soldiers, enough weaponry, uh, what options do you have? Well, one is you could look for allies, right? Let me find some other people that'll be on my side and fight with me. You would think, well, the most logical allies would be those ten tribes to the north. By the way, the very fact that the people of God were divided had weakened them. That occurred in the Old Testament and has been true ever since. When the people of God are divided, they're more easily picked off by the enemy. Don't you think that might be true today? I mean, think about how many different churches there are just within walking distance of here. Now, I'm not trying to denigrate the fact that there are other churches. Don't misunderstand. But think about all the money that's spent and all the different church buildings, all the different ministries, all the different things that are replicated and duplicated because the people of God are not together. What a massive army we could be if just somehow we were together. Now, people can justify our division in every way you can imagine. Well, these people don't believe this, and these people don't do that, and et cetera, and et cetera. No matter how we justify it, the truth of the matter is, by not being together, we are weaker, far, far weaker than we would be if we were united. And if we think that unity is based on 100% agreement, then we might as well dissolve every marriage in the world. Because there's not one, not one, where both of them agree on everything at least not past the first hour of the marriage. I mean, because you don't get very long until it's like, well, where shall we have our honeymoon dinner? And then the discussion ensues. And it goes on from there and on from there. Two people will never agree on everything, much less two groups agree on everything. Of course, it's easy to justify yourself by saying, but unfortunately for them, we're the ones that are right. By the way, everybody thinks that. Else we'd all say, I mean, nobody stands up and says, you know, they're right, we're wrong, we're happy being wrong. We don't do that. So if somehow we could be united, it would change everything. The second thing is, the second thing is, I don't know if you've ever done this or not. It would seem, I would think that by the time I reached my 65th birthday, which is coming up in February, so you need to start planning now. By the time I reached my 65th birthday, I would hope birthday, I would hope I would have learned a lesson that when you feel overwhelmed, when the enemy comes against you, the worst thing you can do is to ally yourself or make an alliance with somebody that's a person or group that you should not be allied with. Because they don't have the same beliefs, they don't have the same values, they don't have the same concerns. Other than me, has anybody here ever, because you felt you were overwhelmed, you were in some kind of a battle, you thought you were going to lose, there was somebody that you called to your side that you somehow made some kind of partnership with when you knew good and well in your heart that it just wasn't the right thing to do? That in your heart of hearts you knew we don't believe the same way, we don't see things the same way, and if we put ourselves together in this particular thing, it's not going to work out. You knew you shouldn't, but you did. Am I the only one who's ever done that? Has it ever turned out to bite you? That you wind up, the battles you fight with your partner turn out to be worse than the battle you had with the enemy that came against you. You say, well, why wouldn't he go up and ask Israel to help him? Well, because two chapters earlier, two chapters earlier, the the king of Israel then was a guy named Ahab. Jehoshaphat had had married a relative of Ahab. So now they're in-laws. So the king of the southern kingdom and the king of the northern kingdom are in-laws. And so they're visiting each other. And Ahab had a hidden agenda. He, he slaughters all these animals. He puts on this great feast for the king of Judah. 
And in the middle of the feast, he says, now, I need to go up to Ramoth Gilead and, and, and defeat those people, and, and I need you to go with me. So Jehoshaphat said, well, my army is your army. I mean, we're buddies, we're pals, we're in-laws after all. And so if you're going to go fight this battle, I'll go with you too. So yeah, I'll be glad to. <laughs> and then he said, but, but before we go, we need to ask of God if he'll bless this battle. So Ahab calls together 400 of his prophets. And as one, they all prophesy, God will be with you. Go up there. You destroy those people. As a matter of fact, one of them had made some iron horns to look like a bull. And he puts them on and starts running around the room like he's goring people. And he says, God said, if you go into battle, you'll gore them like a bull would and all that kind of stuff. And, and Jehoshaphat somehow feels a little uneasy about this. He said, is this all? I mean, is there some other prophet out there we can ask? And he said, well, there's one more, but he's a negative guy. Every time he prophesies, it's always bad about me. So we don't ask him anymore. That's kind of like shooting your guard dog because he barks. Can you see the lack of wisdom in that? I got a dog that warns if somebody's coming, and so now the dog's barking, and I shoot the dog. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and so Jehoshaphat says, well, I think we need to talk to him too. And so they bring him in. And so the other prophets stop him on the way in and said, look, there's 400 of us. We all agree that he should go up there and God's with him. So you say the same thing. <laughs> so this prophet comes up in front of Ahab and Ahab says, well, what does God say? And the prophet said, God said, go do it. Now, it's hard to get the tone of voice from a text. You understand that. By the way, would you agree with me that sometimes you can learn a lot more about how somebody says something other than just the words they say? The, the tone of voice, the way they use their eyes, their body language can communicate a whole lot. Would you agree with that? This prophet does it in such a way that Ahab says, you're lying to me. Tell me the truth. So the prophet says, well... Here's what was happening in heaven. God said, I need somebody to convince Ahab to go up and fight those guys so Ahab will be killed. How can we get him to go? And a spirit steps up and says, I'll go be a lying spirit in the voice of his prophets and they'll convince him to go and he'll die. And so that spirit came down and entered your prophets and they all lied to you because God wants you dead and when you go fight this battle, you're going to die. Ahab turns to Joseph and said, see what I said? I told you everything this guy says about me is negative and mean and bad. See, see? And so he, then he has the prophet arrested, thrown into prison on bread and water. And the prophet said, that's fine. And Jehoshaphat, Ahab said, I'll see you when I come back. And the prophet basically said, you ain't coming back. And he didn't. In the battle, by the way, Ahab got a little scared, and so he turned to Jehoshaphat and said, Now, I tell you what, you go ahead and wear your king robes, and I'm going to wear a disguise. By the way, if the other king was going into battle with you and suggested that you dress like a king and that he was going into disguise, would you somehow get the idea that he wasn't totally confident in the outcome of this battle? Would you somehow get the idea that he was somehow using you? And so the other side sent some people just to kill him. And, and they saw one guy wearing a king's robes, and they came chasing up to that chariot to kill the king. And at the last minute, they realized it was Jehoshaphat, and turned and went the other way. And an archer just shoots an arrow at random into the crowd and kills Ahab. And so what Jehoshaphat has learned is, I can't go ask that northern kingdom to help out because the last time I did, God sent me a message when I came back from the battle as he drove back from the battle where he was almost killed, Jehu came out, Shehu actually. Jehu came out and said, you know why you almost died? Because you helped the wicked. You loved those who hated God. So he's not about to go to the northern kingdom because he knows he cannot allow, ally, put, make an alliance with people who are rebelling against God. You can never win by making a partnership with people who are fighting God. It does not work. Okay. He doesn't have enough army on his own. 
He cannot make an alliance with the others, the Israelis, north of him, because they're not serving God and he knows he's in trouble. He could surrender. He could just give up. You ever get tempted to do that? Where it just seems so overwhelming. He seems like there's no way we can win. Things are just going to get worse and worse and worse, and you just want to throw up your hands and say, I quit. I just quit. I've been there so many times I can't count it. I just want to quit. I just want to walk away. I don't want to fight anymore. But he knew. He knew that was the wrong thing to do. So he's kind of exhausted his options. There's only one thing left to do. Here's what he does. Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Here's what he said. We're going to pray. But it's not going to be just me who's praying. I'm calling everybody to come pray. Everybody. As a matter of fact, you'll read in a few verses. They brought the men. They brought the women. They brought the children. They brought everybody. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord before the new court. That's telling where he was. And said, oh, by the way, not only did they come to pray, it also said that they fasted. Let me give you a preview of coming attractions this fall lord willing i want to talk at least one sunday about fasting why fasting is important not from a physical standpoint but from a spiritual standpoint how fasting can augment prayer and make prayer more powerful and if after we do that sunday about fasting in the fall i'm going to start challenging us at least on occasion to do some fasting along with our prayer. I can tell you now, because I have done this in the past, at least for me, fasting is hard. I can actually go all day long without food because I'm working. You're looking at me going, uh uh. I can go all day long without food because I'm working and I'm so focused on what I'm doing, and then when I get home, I start eating and keep eating and keep eating anybody else understand this I can do all this on one continuous meal from about 7 till 10 but every time I've ever fasted although I can go all day long working and never get hungry every time I ever fasted I starve just knowing that I have decided not to eat makes me ravenously hungry. I'm just going to give you that hint about fasting before we finally get to that sermon. And so they're fasting and they're praying. Now look at his prayer. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? By the way, this is what's called a rhetorical question. He knows that God is in heaven. That's why he's phrasing it this way. Are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Now, if he rules over all the kingdoms of the nations, it means he also rules over those three kingdoms that are coming against them. What he's saying is, you are over everything. You can do what you choose to do. You are all powerful. And that's what he says next. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Now, what did you just say? God, I know. I know you can do whatever you choose to do. I know you have the power to work miracles. I know you have the power to put kings up, to take kings down. I know you have the power to win victories. I know you have the power to give defeats. He knows about the defeats, although he doesn't mention that specifically here. I know he knows about the defeats because just two chapters before, he was in the middle of one where that God was not with them and they lost terribly. So he knows that if God is not in the battle, the battle can be lost. At the same time, he knows that if God is in the battle, the battle can be won. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? You understand that when God gave them the promised land and they came in, they had to defeat country after country, city after city, moving people out ahead of them, and God gave them victory after victory after victory. Now, you also understand, though he doesn't mention it, there were also some terrible defeats that the Israelis suffered when they came into the land. For example, when they came against the city of Ai, they suffered a terrible defeat. 
They discovered later when they asked God, why weren't you with us? You have sent us here. You have put us into these battles. You have blessed us beyond measure. And now these guys whipped us. What went wrong? That's that famous story in the Old Testament where God said, I didn't bless you this time because there is sin in the camp. Meaning that somebody within their number had committed a sin, had hidden the sin, and God said, because of that, I have withdrawn my blessing from you. The victory didn't take place. Although I'm here and have blessed all the other battles, I didn't bless this because there's sin among you. And I'm not blessing you with a great victory when you're encumbered with sin. Just not going to do it. Why do you think he's not mentioning the times they failed? He's not mentioning the times they failed because he's not seeing their failures as being God's fault. He's seeing their victories as being God's blessings. He's seeing their failures as being something that occurs because of something they have done wrong. They either have sin in the camp or God has decided to punish the entire nation by having somebody come against them and do damage to them because they need to straighten up. Now, are you hearing this point? We can look back and see the victories of God. Can you? Can you look back through your life and see times when God has done amazing things? I faced this. It seemed overwhelming. It seemed as if it were going to be an ultimate and total defeat. And then you brought this tremendous blessing and, and this victory was won. At the same time, I think most of us can look back and see at least occasions where we have had defeats. You say, oh, does that mean then that I'm a sinner? Not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a sinner. You understand. Back in the case of Job, when Job's children were killed by the tornado and Job's friends said they died because you're a sinner, that was totally wrong. I'm not saying that any time anything bad in your life occurs, you can look at it and go, this is a direct result of my own sin. Bad things happen because the devil is out there. Bad things sometimes happen to good people because there are enemies that do everything they can to destroy us. Make sure you hear that point. I'm not saying that anytime anything goes wrong, you can look and say, God's punishing me. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying there are times in our lives when we are willfully doing the things we shouldn't do. And then we expect God to give us great blessings. God could if God chose to. But if God were to bless us while we are living in rebellion, then we would think we could live any way we wish and do anything we want. And God chooses not to reward that behavior so that we will not think that he's just a celestial Santa that gives us a gift no matter what. Do you see the difference in those two things? Don't ever look at every tragedy and say, God's punishing me. I think I've told you before that, that I used to do a, a call-in radio program many, many years ago in Montgomery, Alabama on WLWI, the country giant Montgomery, at 10 o'clock on Sunday nights from 10 to 11. And, and every once in a while on that station, I would mention our mentally handicapped daughter, Angel. And one guy called in one night and said that God had just told him to call the radio program and tell me that the reason our daughter was mentally handicapped was because I am a sinner. And that if I would repent of my sins, God would make her have normal intelligence. Now, for anybody whose child has ever suffered anything, what do you think the first reaction of a parent is when that occurs? It's to think that must be right because all of us, each of us is a sinner. No one is perfect. Is that correct? And so it's easy to go, oh my, I can see that must be right. At the same time, though, I had enough theological training to know this guy was absolutely and totally wrong. You are preying on the guilt of a parent that had a child that had something go wrong. You and I both know that God didn't tell you anything. That for whatever demented reason, you have decided to try to hurt me. If you hate me, that's fine. If you wish to attack me, that's your choice. But don't do it this way. My child is not mentally handicapped because of my sin. My child is mentally handicapped because for the first seven minutes after her birth, she could not breathe. That's why she's mentally handicapped. 
So, I hope I'm making enough sense here to make the point. I can't look at anything in my life that goes wrong and say, God is punishing me. At the same time, if I am rebelliously living in sin, why should I expect God to bless me? To say, Lord, we're going to go into this battle. Give me the victory. I think God must look at us and go, if I were to do that, I'm teaching you absolutely the wrong lesson. I'm giving you the belief that you can live any way you wish and that I will just do anything that you want and, uh, want, and that is not true. Now, realizing that, that I am imperfect, that I do not live perfectly and never will live perfectly, although I can live sinlessly. You get the difference in those two things. I don't live perfectly because I'm flawed. I live sinlessly because if I walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. Therefore, I am sinless, though imperfect. You hear that point. Then I can look back when the battles come at me, and until you die, they will. That when the battles come at me, I can look back and say, how can I have the faith to face what's happening now? Here's how I can have the faith to see what's happening or to face what's happening now. It is because of the fact that God at that point in my life, you gave me victory. And at that point in your life, you gave me victory. And at that point in my life, you gave me victory. And even the times when it looked as if we were defeated, you always brought some kind of a blessing out of the defeat. All it took was my being yielded to you and some blessing came even if I went through some destructive event. This is actually a sermon on faith. But it's not to say you can manipulate God. Now, one last point, and we're going to end. Did, not, did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land? Actually, I don't have time for that point. I'm going to have to come to it next week because it gets really intricate here. I'll give you a preview of coming attractions. Here's what he's about to say. God, when you send us in here, there, was, there were a few countries you told us not to invade. There were a few people that you told us not to attack. We left them alone because you told them to. You told us to. Guess what, God? They're the ones that are attacking us now. The ones you said to leave alone, and they're trying to destroy us. Think about it this way before next week. Have you ever done something nice for somebody and then they were the ones who did everything they could to destroy you? Anybody ever had that experience? Well, next week we'll have testimonies. Actually, we probably should. We've all faced that. Well, I'm sorry that I'm only half into this and our time is up. Well, that, this was all the introduction by the way. We're almost to the sermon. <laughs> almost there. If you want to summer to faith, if you want to understand how powerful God can be when it looks as if everything is over, when it looks as if there is no possible way to have victory, this story is all about it. And that's what we'll be next week. Now, if you want, you can cheat. Second Chronicles chapter 20, you can read ahead. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to. And then we'll see if we can take that text apart and see all the things that we can learn there. We've come to a time of helping. If we can be of assistance to you, make your need known while we stand and sing. Hide me.